question with our panelists. But before we get into it and before I introduce them, I want to give you a brief overview of where we are as an industry and why this conversation on harnessing financial literacy to combat fraud is quite is very important. So as we've seen throughout the sessions today, mobile money has leaped forward, providing advanced financial services to 1.6 billion registered users in 102 countries. It's, we've been able to transact $1.26 uh, $1 trillion in 2022. New partnerships have emerged and mobile money services have evolved to offer more advanced products like remittances, savings, credit, and insurance. This is aimed at creating greater consumer resilience and driving consumer and economic empowerment. It's what we've been told earlier, we are getting into the space of super apps. McKinsey and Company estimates that by 2025, the GDP of emerging economies will grow to $3.7 trillion due to the continued use of digital finance. Several factors will drive this growth, such as product innovation, stakeholder collaboration, and enabling regulatory environment. While these factors will set the stage for growth, Consumer financial knowledge levels, trust, and safety by design will determine the industry sustainability. Since consumer digital finance literacy levels and trust are key determinants of mobile money growth. According to the World Bank Findex Report 2021, one third of mobile money account holders in Sub-Saharan Africa could not use their mobile money account without help women are actually 5% more likely than men to need help using their mobile money account. Consumer trust and safety is also still among the highest reason hindering the uptake and usage of mobile money services. An aspect that has been actually further impacted by the evolution of mobile money fraud types. From traditional SMS fraud to mobile app fraud and scams, biometrics, identity theft, and social engineering incidents. These factors have been actually exacerbated by low financial literacy among vulnerable and underserved communities. This highlights the importance of improving consumer literacy levels to enhance mobile money adoption and usage. Efforts should be made to provide accessible and comprehensive financial literacy programs, especially targeting vulnerable and underserved communities in order to build trust and confidence in using mobile money services effectively. By increasing mobile money users' digital financial literacy levels, individuals in vulnerable and underserved communities will have a better understanding of how to navigate mobile money services and avoid potential pitfalls. Additionally, financial literacy programs can empower these communities to make informed decisions and take advantage of the benefits that mobile money can offer. Ultimately, promoting financial inclusion and reducing the risk of financial exploitation. Our panel of experts will explore the role of digital financial literacy and in, in mitigating fraud, strategies that have been employed uh, to advance financial literacy initiatives, the role played by policymakers and regulators in driving financial inclusion and literacy in the market. Finally, they will touch on opportunities available for continued collaboration among stakeholders based on their individual country context. Please join me in welcoming on stage our panel session moderator, Mr. Ahmed Damish, who is the lead specialist in policy and government advocacy on inclusive digital ecosystem at the United Nations Capital Development Fund. Thank you, Mary, for that uh, introduction, and welcome everyone to this final session. Um, as Mary said, this is uh, hopefully, I'm very confident, will be quite an interesting conversation about the intersection of literacy and fraud and mobile money. Uh, in many ways, it kind of seems obvious that if you don't know how to use it, you can be taken advantage of, irrespective of what it is. 
um, the consequences of being taken advantage of in, in the context of financial services is obvious. And it becomes even more obvious if you are in low income and losing a dollar means a lot. Um, and if you can imagine, you layer on top of that the shame of being tricked into losing that dollar. And so when you start thinking about literacy and the context of literacy and, and, and the degree to which it affects the vulnerable communities who we want to be less vulnerable and can contribute to economic growth and stability, uh, this is very much a conversation about where the rubber meets the road. And I think with this panel here, uh, we have an amazing diversity of perspectives, uh, which you'll hear more from them than from me, for sure, um, to kind of give us as a collective some sense of how do we break down uh, the experience of all players in the market, government, private sector, civil society, development partners, and understanding how we all look at this differently, and then maybe coming up with some solutions. Um, and uh, you know, maybe we can find ways to be a bit provocative at the end. Um, so with that, allow me to introduce our panelists first. So we have Victor Odada, the head of M-Pesa Payments. Um, and we have Rosemary Mupufo. I forgot to ask how to pronounce that, so I hope that worked. <laughs> um, Executive Director at Consumer Council in Zimbabwe. We have Nito Omanga, Deputy Director of uh, Banking and Payment Services at the Central Bank of Kenya. We have Luis Qatar, a Strategic Advisor. And we have Gwen Snyder, a senior advisor, gender and financial and digital inclusion at USAID. And so, as you can see, we have very different profiles up here. So, Victor, I'm going to start with you, um, maybe because your profile is probably the most, one of the most recognizable, coming from a mobile operator, um, and in the mobile money context, an OG mobile operator, right? So, as head of Impesa Payments, you know that fraud is not good for business. Uh, and serving customers, particularly at the scale that you have to, is costly but also essential. So how has MPESA dealt with this? How do you look at the intersection of fraud and literacy? And maybe give us a couple, couple examples of that. Okay, um, thanks for that. Um, when you look at what we're trying to do is specifically on education around this piece as Safaricom, we've done a couple of things. Obviously, in collaboration with our regulator who's, who's with us. Uh, we do have an academy uh, uh, called Empress Academy, which we do use to, uh, de uh, you know, send out information, share information, trying to school more, more, most of our customers in terms of the new trends that are happening uh, in the market. Because one of the few things, as an operator, we're always changing and improving the, the services we offer. But the more you change, the more you improve, the better the fraudsters also, you know, figure out new ways uh, to try and beat the system. So in collaboration, we do provide uh, sessions, academy sessions, we go out in the market, we train uh, uh, consumers, we do send out SMSs and notifications to allow, alert them in terms of uh, the new trends, uh, what's happening, what the capabilities of our uh, different offerings out there in the market to ensure that they are as well versed and, uh, if you want to call it, armed to be able to look out for, if you want to call it, fraudulent um, behavior. Obviously, um, the, the interesting bit is you're dealing with, uh, close to what, 40, uh, 40 million individuals, they're those individuals who will uh, be impacted. And, and do, those we, as uh, Safaricom, we do take seriously. We do try and support where we can. Uh, if we're able to support, even from an investigation perspective, with, uh, if you want to call it, the other arms of enforcement within the country, we, we collaborate. And, and we, do, we have had successful cases where we brought some of these people uh, to justice and, and, and it's made some of our customers whole. So it's always a collaboration, both from a policy perspective, but also most important is enforcement. So it's not, I wouldn't say it's, a, it's an operator problem. It's also a regulator problem, but also in enforcement. So it's, you, you need the three to work in tandem um, to ensure that then this issue is actually managed better, uh, I think, from a country perspective and also geographically uh, in the rest of Africa. That's, that's great. And I like um, a couple of things you said there that are probably worth pointing out. Uh, one, that criminals will always be one step ahead, right? So this idea of collaboration really means that you have to, what I'm hearing is you have to collaborate to be able to be one step ahead of the, the, the crime in itself. But one thing I think that we don't talk about is enforcement and the degree to which the role of the provider in enforcing that. Um, and I think the interesting thing about Kenya, and you have you know, very well-structured, robust institutions. You have a central bank that you can't collaborate with. And I think Luis kind of 
thinking about your near situation in Somalia in particular, you know, the degree of institutional capacity in a very fragile market is very different. And so, you know, in your role, sort of advising Harmon in this context, um, you know, what, what, can you maybe give us a sense of what that environment is like when you have uh, such a large provider? There's more, you told me there were seven total mobile money providers, and yet you clearly have the dominant one. Central bank, um, you know, has different levels of capacity than, say, Kenya, right? So what is that experience like, um, and where do you see literacy and fraud kind of intersecting in the context of Somalia? Yeah, th and thank you for having me on the stage today. Um, to set the scene in Somalia, uh, only 25% of women are literate, yet 80% of the population use mobile money and use it regularly to the tune of about $2.8 billion per month and, in terms of transactions. Um, I advise Hormud Telcoms, which is the largest uh, mobile uh, money operator in Somalia, uh, Hormuz um, provide uh, mobile money services uh, at the point of use for free to drive financial inclusion uh, and partner with close to now 100 different UN uh, international and local NGOs for that last mile uh, humanitarian uh, mobile money transfers. Um, and uh, we do a lot. Uh, like many MNOs to try and mitigate fraud from software to data protection, from having our own internal redress mechanism to mistraining to using and adapting some of the GSMA digital financial literacy toolkits. Um, we invest in education more broadly, but we've got this uh, illiteracy issue which is, is relevant. Um, and just to give a couple of examples that have worked differently, you know, we were doing text alerts, but if people can't read, then they're useless. And so uh, we tried a few months ago to adapt uh, emergency response alerts that we had used during COVID times, whereby when a customer rings another customer, the ringtone is replaced with a recorded voice message in Somali that says, you know, uh, watch out for fraud. These are the types and risks of fraud, and this is what can be done about it. And in three months, it reduced fraud cases by 40 percent. So there's, there's that issue. And then on the capacity issue, um, we were asked to help a, a local municipality that was struggling to raise funds. Now, whether that was for, because of misinformation, misappropriation, or fraud, um, Hormuz helped with mobile money and in, uh, increased revenue, particularly because there's trust in Hormuz uh, by consumers um, by fivefold. Um, I do think that um, capacities and market conduct are really important. So it's not just on the shoulders of the private sector nor on the shoulders of the consumer. In fragile states like Somalia, there's issues around effective law and order, regulatory frameworks, uh, policy, national identification systems, and basic education aside from education for, for or training for digital financial literacy. There's just basic education that's required. So there's components beyond uh, or, or that complement what, what private sector and consumers can do. It's fascinating. The recording replacing ringtone, do they opt into that? How does that work? Uh, when they sign the, uh, yeah, sign up as uh, a, cu a customer, they sort of do. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, you can just imagine the shock. It's kind of, but, but I mean, the fact that it was dropped in 40% is, yeah. is, is fascinating. I think that's a, a great example of, you know, I have to sort of think differently um, in those sort of contexts um, and to meet the customer where they're at yes. and not, you know, sort of for, force the customer to come to you, but to acknowledge that they can hear fine, right? And, you know, Rosemary, this brings me to your role in, with the Consumer Council in, in Zimbabwe, because consumers are by definition at the front, on the front line of fraud and, and mobile money. And so we should be, as a community, empowering consumers to represent their own rights and their own needs. Um, that's not always easy to do because you have different types of consumers, different levels, et cetera. And we'd love to hear from you from the perspective of the Consumer Council. Uh, 
what examples can you share with us in terms of how you have actually worked to represent consumers, how you've empowered them to advocate for themselves, um, and maybe give us some examples of how that's um, operated in practice. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Um, let me begin by saying, in the words of J.F. Kennedy, that consumers, by definition, include us all. All of us are consumers. Whether we are regulators, we are service providers, we are, at the end of the day, all of us are consumers. And yet, our voice is the least heard, you know, despite us being the majority within the economic. So, um, in terms of consumer protection, as you rightly say, it's important that the consumer voice is empowered. And the consumer's right to be heard must always be made a priority. So for us, as Consumer Council of Zimbabwe, what we have managed to do since 2021, when working with Consumers International, of which we are a member of CI, uh, they introduced um, Fair Digital Financial Services Project and uh, World Consumer Rights Day 2022, on the 15th of March, we celebrated with the theme, Fair Digital Financial Services. So at CCZ, Consumer Council of Zimbabwe, we then uh, programmed our work towards achieving uh, that as a goal, to say we would want every consumer within our country to understand their digital rights in financial services and particularly in mobile money. So we then discovered we could not do it alone. We needed to work with partners. And we approached our central bank, which is the Reserve Bank of Zimbabwe. We also approached our telecoms uh, regulator, the Postal and Telecommunications Regulatory Authority of Zimbabwe. We also approached the Zimbabwe Republic Police and other key stakeholders. And um, we started having campaigns, uh, some of which are in the form of road shows. The road shows are mainly um, activities around, you know, drawing the attention of consumers. So we will have a big truck with um, music playing, loud music, and it draws consumers to come. And we will be having people dancing on that, on that track. And they invite everyone to come and join the dance. So people dance. And after a large crowd comes, we then start having short presentations, just educational messages from all the key stakeholders present. present. So Consumer Council of Zimbabwe is leading that campaign, and um, we have managed to carry out numerous roadshows throughout the country. So these happen normally every two months. We have three roadshows with all our key stakeholders. Then we also have what we call community engagement sessions. We mobilize consumers sometimes to the tune of 500, 1,000 people. They come in a large hall, and we educate them on their rights, on their digital rights. Uh, the central bank also does the same, again, with the telecoms uh, regulator. Uh, it would be very important also to mention that as a consumer organization, we would not have managed to do it alone. Uh, because first of all, the funding is not there. Uh, and the technical expertise to explain on the issues is sometimes not there. And what happens is when we are in that gathering, people are also given the opportunity to ask questions. And we always have a complaints desk where they can actually go and register their complaints and they get redress, which is also one of the consumer rights. So we have really found that method to work very well, particularly because it draws together all the key stakeholders. 
it has also empowered us as a consumer organization because, first of all, it has um, created um, acquaintance with the regulators. Even if we receive a complaint within the office of CCZ, we are now able to speak to the regulators freely and they can help us to resolve the complaint. Sometimes we even refer the complainant to them. So it does work wonders. And it's important just to share that collaboration has worked wonders in the area of uh, consumer awareness. So like I said, we started the program on World Consumer Rights Day according to the global consumer movement. But because we realized that it had worked wonders, we decided to take it, to roll it over even you know, going forward. We still hold those campaigns to this day. It is now an ongoing program. That's amazing. Um, congratulations. And I think this idea of the dancing truck is a form of advocacy. I hope GSMA is taking notes. Uh, <laughs> that could work quite well. This theme of um, collaboration, I think, is starting to emerge, right? Nobody can do this alone. It's really interesting, uh, you know, how you, many times you articulated the relationship with the government and the central bank and, 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 and others. Um, it, the one thing I'd like to highlight, though, as well, is the, the outcome of your engagement with consumers is, was really about awareness. Mm -hmm. So this implicit, you know, it's not about teaching someone to be numerate or teaching them to read necessarily. We, we use this term literacy, I think, very, very broadly. And I think you just described in many ways, like the reality can be, you can have a lot of change just by making people more aware of that. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, the limits of that might be where the central bank comes in, et cetera. Uh, and so Nita, you know, thinking about your roles in the CBK, um, and, you know, the central bank's been brought up a couple, literally, by, you know, one of your regulated entities, but also, you know, in, in, um, in Rosemary's context, you know, what are the limits of policy intervention? You know, what is acceptable to accept, expect from the regulator? Um, where should you get involved? And where do you feel like the market should be doing the work? Okay. Um, thank you, Ahmed. <coughs> I think the regulator has a very key role in oversight and supervision of our licensees, which include among banks and others, mobile money uh, providers, um, payment service providers, anyone that is involved in, in payments in this specific case. Um, I think our role begins at the design phase because we approve um, not just the player, but we also approve the products. And in reviewing uh, these products, we certainly look at all of the risk factors, what, what is likely to happen to all parties, because we're, we're looking at um, the risks that are posed not just to the consumer, who is the, per the person buying or the person paying, but even the merchant and the business, the utility providers, etc. And we find that uh, because they're different forms of fraud, um, people take advantage of different circumstances to commit fraud. And this could even include um, the, the stability of the payments infrastructure, the platform that the PSP or the mobile money provider is using, their policies on business continuity. So what happens when they go down? What happens to the rest of us? Yes, my provider is down, but what happens to me? Um, because the provider is down, I don't have I don't have sight of maybe my cards or my mobile money account is being used fraudulently. We also look at things like the dispute resolution framework because what pains you most um, when a fraud occurs is how your provider was able to resolve that or not. So we look at the dispute resolution framework. <clears throat> we look at the roles and responsibilities of each party, especially where there are partnerships um, the mobile money provider may have outsourced or maybe partnering with another entity. So we look at the roles and responsibilities. We look at who is, uh, who ought to be liable uh, in case there's any loss. Um, we also look at the capacity for that, that provider to monitor transactions and whether they have any fraud detection system. So this really is at the design of the product. Um, and I think that's where a very if we get that right, then we expect fewer problems moving forward. Um, 
the role of the regulator again is to create a very conducive environment. So in looking at all those things that I've mentioned doesn't mean we are stifling innovation. Um, we're actually enabling it and making sure that all players have a level playing field um, in which to participate. They, we, they need to understand that we are also protecting them by putting in these measures in place. We're protecting them as well as their own end customers. Um, regulation, the regulatory framework ought to be something that is clear. Um, so it should not shift from one player to the to another. It ought to be clear, it ought to be transparent, it ought to be pre uh, predictive uh, for all stakeholders in place. Now, we look um, further to the, the T's and C's because as you onboard a customer, if, for example, Empress has onboarded a customer or a merchant, they get into a contractual agreement. So we look at those uh, terms and conditions to make sure that they're fair um, to all the parties and that um, if an incident does happen, then your provider can't just turn around and say, well, you know, this is your fault. Uh, now go and sort it out because you failed to do one or two things. So these are some of the controls that we, we, we do uh, take great keen interest in. We are also um, going forward trying to work with the industry to, to set base level standards so that um, a dispute or a fraud happening on one provider is handled more or less similarly to another provider. So we don't have this currently in Kenya. We don't have um, standards for dispute resolution and I think that's an area that we can work together with the industry uh, to bring that forward. Um, but I think it's also important that when we talk about literacy and fraud, we don't have all the data because a lot of fraud is not reported. And I think maybe the GSMA team can help us here. Um, we do know, for example, in Kenya, a lot of fraud is happening with the elderly people because they do have phones, um, their retirees, their children send them money. Um, but that money is being withdrawn, um, possibly at the agent or possibly even by a family member, but that is still fraud. And these are some of the very vulnerable segments that need to be addressed. Um, and I think with you know ongoing generations, it, it will get better, but with the ones that are currently there now, how much are they actually being defrauded of their, their monies? And it's true, Safaricom, for example, has done a lot of work, um, and they did more than 10 years ago really telling people don't disclose your PIN, um, your PIN is secret, etc. But there's a generation of people that they can't do the transaction. So they go for support. So we need to, in our education to them, um, really make it very um, segment specific. The messaging to people you know, in the rural area, the messaging to people in the city is actually quite different. And we need to look at different age groups. Um, around that. Um, another thing that we need to address is looking at the different types of frauds because how you address them is, is quite different. We've got something simple like the 419 scams, which are still ongoing, again, targeting vulnerable uh, people. So what I'm trying to say is the messaging needs to be targeted for the different types of fraud and for the different segments of the population. Thank you. No, thank you. That was, I have so many questions that we don't have time for. Um, I'm trying to think which ones to, to sort of uh, focus on. This last point about segmentation, not all customers are the same, not all fraud is the same, and uh, sort of the design of the product. I really love how you mentioned that, because I think regulators often don't think about design, and you know, at what point can you intervene to actually make it better for the provider. And so there's that communication, not just collaboration, do you see it the same way? Now that early regulatory intervention, will that make you know, my life easier, whether it's compliance or whether it's more revenue or profitability or whatnot? So you know, is there just a commercial case or is there just a regulatory case for getting involved at the design phase? You really ended with the view on the customer and it reminded me 
I've been, I'm old, I've been in this for a while, and I remember when I first went to Kenya speaking to one of your old compatriots, um, I said that M-Pesa was easy, and he said, no, it's not. My parents really struggle, but it's so useful, it's worth learning. Now at the time, we thought that was such an amazing trait. Now, here we are, you know, 14 years later from when I had that conversation, and now we see actually there's a double side to that. There's an inelastic demand. People need it. So if you don't have the capability, you have no choice but to give up your pin. And so it's really the other side of the same thing that scaled it is, is also leading to now what we're seeing as some of its weaknesses. So you know, the relationship between how you develop the conducive environment or just simply as a regulator aware of that, um, I think is really fascinating. Which, Gwen, leads me to your, to your side from USAID as a development partner and as you had mentioned to me before, really one that likes to get involved at the ground level, like really seeking solutions to this. Um, and you've invested quite a lot in this space, in the intersection of literacy and fraud, you know, picking up on the theme of like, what is the experience of the customer? You know, maybe you can tell us a little bit about that study that you had mentioned to us, um, uh, specifically on the impact of fraud and the experience of women, um, and some of the insights that emerged from that and share us about that project and why development partners like USAID should be more involved in this space. Sure, thanks, I'll do that. Um, I'd, I'd start maybe with the second question and then the first. Um, I think that you know, USAID has a long history, um, of an established history, I would say, of investing in, um, really, I would, I, would, I, would, I would term it as public awareness campaigns that are also you know, geared towards um, disseminating information about, um, you know, digital literacy. And it's everything from how to use, you know, a smartphone, how to save on the savings platform, how to use mobile money, um, but it's also then how to keep yourself safe. And, and looking at and understanding that there are huge advantages, um, you know, to, um, to this mobile world, including mobile money, and there are also um, barriers that can prevent its use. And I think that USAID really sees um, fraud as a barrier, meaning we know, studies have shown, that especially for women and girls, if they are exposed to, um, to fraud, to um, infringements of data protection, identity theft, um, think digital theft in general, it, they become very, very reticent to you know, using uh, technology in the future. They really have to overcome that. And it can have um, substantial effect over a lifetime in terms of their interest in um, learning how to use technology and engaging in it, it engaging with it. And so um, I think that uh, the other part of this is that we know if we follow those breadcrumbs that um, if, a, if, a, if, if a girl is exposed to data fraud or a, a young adult, a young woman, um, or even a young man, I would also say, of course, is that, and, and they become, you know, reticent to learning how to use technology, and that affects their economic, um, you know, prospects and their economic opportunities, that ultimately is going to affect um, their resilience to, um, you know, to downturns in the economy. It's also going to, I think, um, you know, affect um, their their livelihoods and the income that their household experiences. So that's why we're involved, right? We take it back to economic um, stability, economic opportunities, and and resilience. Um, and in terms of you know what we've done, um, I think that one of the more, more recent examples is um, we partnered with several um, mobile operators to offer, hey sister, show me the mobile money. And we did this um, over a four year period in um, Uganda, um, Ghana, and Malawi. And, and in Ghana, it was picked up by MTN. And in Malawi and uh, Uganda, it was picked up by VMO. And um, two things about this. One, it was an open source platform, so radio stations could pick it up, um, and, and anyone else broadcasting. And it was also um, a very simple platform for women to call into. It was a VPN, 
and um, you know this interactive voice response platform, and they were kind of soap opery. We we had um, the implementing partner who did this. They hired local actors and actresses. There was an engaging storyline, and uh, but they were really talking about. Um, these really important digital literacy topics. And, um, and I would say probably 80% of the success stories that we heard back from the participants, it was around fraud, it was around scams. Um, I remember there was one example where a, a woman, she was literally headed out the door to her, um, her group to talk about the latest episode of Hey Sister, Show Me the Mobile Money, and she received a phone call from someone she didn't know and um, it, was, it was a man that said, oh my gosh, I have to talk to you. You have just won free groceries for a month. You just need to pay for the shipping to your house. And you will never have to leave your house for the next 30 days to go buy groceries. And this is gonna be so easy. Just give me your, um, you know, your, your bank account information and we're done. And she's looking, she's scrambling, she's running all over her house, looking for her bank account information and can't find it. And she says, okay, I'm gonna call you back, give me your phone number, I've gotta to run to a meeting. She, doesn't, he do, she does not say what, what the meeting is or the purpose of this meeting, which is to talk about scams and, and fraud. Um, and so she writes it down she, and she runs off to the meeting. She gets to the meeting, hey sisters, oh my gosh, I just won free groceries for a month. This is amazing. And the sisters start asking some questions, like good sisters do, right? And, and says, well, wait a minute, do you know this person? Did you give them any information? And the facilitator of this meeting group of these women to talk about the latest Mobile Money episode said, let's call that young gentleman that called you, let's put him on speaker. They put him on speaker, they called him up. He's very, he's like, oh, ladies, I have groceries for all of you. Just get out your bank information and we can make this happen. And the facilitator of this program said, ladies, start asking your questions. And they started really saying, well, what do you mean? And why do you need our bank information? And who do you represent? He hung up. And, and they tried to call him back. He didn't answer the phone. Would you? Would you? No, I wouldn't either if I was this man and I had six or seven women and a facilitator asking me pretty good questions um, related to data and, and fraud. And so this works. This works at the grassroots level. It works in communities. Hey Sister reached over 260,000 people in these countries over this four year period. And of those, about at least 170,000 uh, were women. And those were direct people who accessed um, this, this programming. It was for men and women. And it doesn't really take into consideration the number of indirect um, people who benefited from it. For example, I just shared this story with all of you, you know, and so it's it's that it's that mouth to mouth, it's 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 that contact with your neighbor, your relative, the person who's coming through town is only going to be there for a couple days, and it's going back home. Um, so it it really does work at the grassroots level, and and that's where USAID operates in a lot of its programming. Thank you. Um, sorry for losing the, my voice a little bit. That <clears throat> anecdote. I think highlights a couple things that I want to pull the yarn on a little bit, right? Is the, the role of community in giving people the confidence just to pause for a minute and reconsider this action they're about to take, right? I mean, to Victor's point, you know, the criminals are very good. You know, the social engineering, I, I mean, I've been in a situation where I'm like, hold on a minute, you know, this close to that click or to whatnot. Um, even with my own bank, that's happened once. Well, I just didn't trust them for some reason. I, you know, and I had to, I called a friend who banks with this. He's like, yeah, no, it's a new process. They just, I thought they were asking me different questions. And so irrespective of the sophistication level, but I think we know if you wanna scale the impact in these low literacy, low capability environments, really getting in at that community level has a ton of potential. And again, I think it's you know, similar to the ringtone, right? Now, there's a lot of innovative ways where you can affect a large amount of people at scale, and I think we've heard some really good examples. One thing that you mentioned, <clears throat> particularly about young girls in particular, is this idea that if you get it right up front, at the design phase, it can have a generational effect. And that kind of highlights the imperative as well, 
we're not just trying to make it easier or reduce the market the risk at, at the market level and make markets more stable or improve our commercial profile but really we're talking about creating better customers in the future we're creating more stability more economic opportunities um, over the course of generations um, and I wouldn't make that statement if you didn't do this over 260,000 people so that number can't be can't be ignored so we have one final question um, and we don't have a ton of time, so I want to save a little bit of time for questions. So <clears throat> I'm going to scrap the original group question that we had. And this is one for all of you to answer. Um, rank one, two, and three. Who is most responsible for solving literacy and fraud? And you can choose between the consumer, the regulator, or the provider. Victor? There is no right answer, by the way. <laughs> no, thanks for that. Um, it, 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 it could be a career ender. Uh, but um, if you think about it critically, uh, the more you empower the community, the better the, the outcome. So um, the responsible, I would say, is a joint effort between regulator and operator. Uh, because end of the day, we are here to serve customers. And as you, as you mentioned, we we'll always be evolving, bringing in new services, uh, and we should empower the customer as best as possible. I mean, yes, we're a commercial entity, we'd love to make as much as we potentially can, but at the same same time, impact the community as best as we can. And if you look at um, Safaricom's ethos, is about improving lives. And as we improve lives, we do have a social responsibility to ensure that we are also effectively protecting our customers in, in that journey. So your question actually is a bit of a conundrum uh, to answer. Uh, That's fine, by design. By design. <laughs> but, but I think, um, for the sake of time, I think you've answered it well. So I, I think we'll, Rosemary, what do you, what's, your, what's your answer? I don't want you to dig yourself into a hole. I think you've ended in a really nice spot there. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you. I, I would uh, agree with what um, he's saying, but um, I want to believe that the regulator has the biggest role to play in terms of bringing fairness between the service provider and the consumer. The consumer is coming in and they have to be empowered by regulation. Sometimes if countries do not have consumer protection regulation, no matter how the consumers are empowered, to know their rights and to demand for them. If there is no supporting regulatory frameworks, it becomes very difficult. So yes, it's considered effort with collaboration and partnerships between consumers, the regulators, policymakers, governments, but also the service providers. And in this day, it works better if we work in collaboration with each other. And expectation is that for those um, countries or jurisdictions that still do not have consumer protection policies and laws, now is the time to do so. Because technology is moving very fast and service providers will sometimes forget that they need to go along with the consumers because those technologies that are being developed are meant to be used by consumers. Now, if they move alone and leave the consumers behind, we'll continue to have these problems. Yeah. So whenever new policies are being made, the consumer voice must always be there. Yeah. Whenever new technologies are being developed, the voice of the consumer must always be there. When standards are being developed, the consumer stakeholder voice must also be there. Yeah. So no, I, I think that's very clear. The regulator voted number one. Um, how would you rank it, Nita? Yeah, I think um, the responsibility is on policymakers. And I want to spin this a little bit. Um, Recently, there was a Safaricom Engineering Summit, and we were privileged to hear from, among other speakers, the ambassador of Estonia. And she told us that in her country, 
financial literacy starts from kindergarten. And mm -hmm. I believe that um, we cannot address financial literacy for fraud mm -hmm. and leave everything. It has to be holistic. Mm -hmm. It has to be about financial health and responsibility and all of that education needs to come in together holistically and it has to be in our system of education. And that's for prosperity. Thank you. Is there another vote for government intervention? Louise, where do you sit on this one, two, three ranking? I, I'm going to be controversial. Good, good. <laughs> and it may, it may be against what my colleagues from Hormood uh, believe. But I, whilst I agree very much with my colleagues, uh, in a fragile setting like Somalia, I think that the private sector, whether they want to or not, have a very important role. And if they protect and help people when they are vulnerable to fraud and other types of vulnerability, when that customer then becomes a micro entrepreneur, they will also protect uh, the private sector back. So I think it's an investment that will keep the customer in the ecosystem and as they grow, you'll grow with them. That's a very good commercial case, well done. Um, Gwen? Sure, um, I, I think that um, and again, speaking from you know USAID's perspective, one thing that um, we really um, you know want to use to the best of our ability is is our convening power to really bring um, actors to the same table, key stakeholders that might not normally cross paths, and um, or really have direct you know conversations with each other. And so you know I think that you know from from USAID's perspective, we want all three of, of those actors in the room talking. We want the mobile operators talking with um, and advocating for, you know, policy reforms, you know, at the government level or and um, and at that at that regulation level. But we also want, you know, you know, consumer, you know, groups that that are representing the the people actually, you know, using um, the technology. To really be, you know, speaking loud and clearly um, to to both the, the regulators in terms of the policies that they think are needed to protect them, as well as to the mobile operators um, in in terms of um, you know public awareness campaigns. I, I I do think that or or for example bringing in public radio, um, you know, for for some of this messaging or the private sector, and so I, I to me um, you know I think that. We see it as convening everyone together to, um, you know, to solve this um, this barrier. I don't want to say problem. I think it's a it's a barrier. Fraud and and scams. They, they it is a barrier to effectively using technology. But it's going to take it's going to take a whole systems in the room approach and everyone in the ecosystem talking to each other and and really making um, you know concrete decisions. And, 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 and plans to act on those and implement. Thanks, I'm gonna, um, I think, do you have time for questions? So as you guys are thinking about your questions, <clears throat> I love my metaphors and analogies, and I think you just brought one to mind, this problem versus uh, barrier, right? And this assumption that fraud is not going away. It's not zero failure. We're always gonna have it in some form. There's always gonna be an effort. And so the way a mountain is a barrier, you can't get rid of it. You know, but you can come up with ways of going through it, under it, around it, over it, in ways that actually can contribute. Right? And so I think that's an interesting question. So if I did my counting and there were three, four providers and four votes for regulators being the primarily responsible, and when you, you know, sort of wrap that up nicely and so the consumer is not absolved entirely, um, we have a little bit of time for two or three questions. Um, from the audience. You're dependable. Okay, Enoch speaking from Central Bank of Kenya. I'm just having a comment. I think uh, one of the things which we have to consider in terms of reduction of fraud is when we are onboarding our customers. Uh, the process, making sure that those people who are registering this customer, they are capturing all the documents which are needed correctly. Secondly, 
is about KYC, knowing your customer appropriately. If it's an old man, you understand how to explain to him so that he can do it by himself. It's just a comment, it was not a question. Thank you. Any other, any other question? Yeah, please. Yeah. You know, I do agree with you. I think it's about knowing your customer. I think also KYC, it's know your culture. And when I, when I, I say that, I mean that um, if, if fraud is really prevalent and deeply, deeply part of um, a, the, the culture of technology of a country, um, it really translates into fear. And, um, and, I, and I have a specific example. Um, I was in Honduras recently, and they have much more connectivity. They have a lot more, um, I would say, tablets and smartphones and computers out there um, you know, being, being used. But um, in terms of using you know, technology for good, using technology for mobile money transactions, for example, um, the digital literacy is there. It's, it comes right alongside the fear. They are completely um, so terrified of being taken advantage of, of, of frauds and, and scams and, and losing their savings because they gave it to the wrong person, that it, it really has um, affected uh, the amount of um, mobile transactions that occur and credit cards that are used, any kind of fintech. It's, um, it, it has really crippled their economy. They prefer largely to operate in cash. And, and we know, you know, that is, that is it's, it's just not nearly as effective. And so I, I think that a greater question also, also that I've been asking myself is what, you, what do you do in the countries or in the communities where there really is a culture of fear around this because the, the fraud is so pervasive? And that, that is, I think, absolutely an issue. No, I think, I think that's a, it's a really good point in that um, at the design phase, you know, who are you designing for? Um, and also, you know, this question of, you know, when you do see prevalence of fraud in relation to financial services, this is also a leading indicator of other issues. It could be poor design, it could be infrastructure, it could be community-based, it could be age-based. And so I, I think what we've learned from this panel is that, you know, many of us may have come into it thinking it's like, can you read, can you do math? And is that being taken advantage of? And now I think we see that it's a really much more three-dimensional issue um, where getting in at the community level, getting in early, um, making it collaborative uh, is really part of the solutioning around it. And it does have to be country-based, know your culture to a degree, but I also feel like there's a lot of lessons that came out that would probably apply quite broadly to a lot of different places. And I'm gonna leave you just with some terms that I <clears throat> wrote down listening to you guys. Um, that may highlight the range of ways of looking at this. Trust is key, thinking about trust at the customer level. It's not a blame game, it's not who's responsible for it, right? Um, it's a shared burden. Uh, awareness is extraordinarily powerful, especially if you can make it systematic and expected, whether it's a dancing truck or whether it's a, you know, a telenovela or some sort of you know, radio uh, campaign. The design phase, get in early work with others as you're designing it. Accountability seems obvious, but then this idea that it can contribute to systemic stability, right? Particularly if you're thinking about it at a generational level. This level playing field, I think from the regulator, that's really key, like all providers need to be considered the same um, if you really want that stability. Uh, and data, do you even know what's happening and who's being affected by it? I like how you captured it. Um, I I know it's know your culture, uh, but we have to also be cognizant in terms of what's happening in Africa. Africa is embracing more and more technology at a very fast rate. And if you look at financial services, uh, most of it uh, is on the, on, if you want to call it, the back of GSM services. So it's used, the KYC that was picked was mostly for GSM, and then you evolve it into financial uh, services. And the beauty about Africa right now, um, think about even where we are at Kigali right now, you've got a lot of adoption of, um, if you want to call it cloud computing. We're, we're going big in terms of fintechs. Uh, everyone is, is innovating around uh, 
payment services, uh, mo mobility. So yes, there, there is an element of fear, but at the same, same time, you've got this amazing, robust uh, culture that wants to improve and also participate more and more in, if you want to call it, in e-commerce. E so I think when it comes to both the regulator and the operators, even in enforcement, uh, as much as we go through this journey uh, to be as effective, we should not stifle the whole element of growth that we're seeing in, as Africans become more and more a digital savannah. So that piece is very important because if you look at a lot of the jobs these days you see in Africa, that's actually most governments are pushing for, is to enable the youth to become more and more independent. So most become, I've realized they can actually become developers. Amazon is big on, uh, if you want to call it, uh, providing, um, if you want to call it, academies for, if you, for these young girls and, and guys to be able to start, get certified. Safaricom does the same. I'm sure the same is in all our different countries. So yes, there is a need for us to evolve how we look at financial services and potentially, um, and I'm sure it's something even as GSMA has noticed over time, soon the, there will be a flip where we will start leading with financial services and GSM will be secondary. That is coming. I mean, I'm sure in other forums where we've noticed voice is taking a hit because of data. But as we evolve, bo uh, that's why I said earlier, it's important that we evolve in collaboration with the regulators and also the, uh, the NGOs when you're doing, uh, when doing trainings because you can't have a training being done and the, if you want to call it the MNO is also has evolved past the training that's going out. So it's got to be collaborative effort. Yes, policy is in place but the training must be sustained, both from an MNO perspective and also from an NGO. So it literally, it's almost saying, please get on board with us uh, in this journey, together with the regulator, and as we better uh, educate and protect our customers. I think we're gonna end on that. I'd like to ask you all to give the panel a round of applause. Thank you very much, Victor, that was excellent. Thank you. <clears throat> and I'd like to invite Ashley to come up. Great, thank you, Ahmed, and thank you to our panelists. This is such an important topic. Uh, mobile money, digital financial services at large have made such significant gains in financially including those that have traditionally been locked out of formal financial institutions. These users have overcome huge barriers to having a mobile money account and finally being financially included. But the threat of fraud threatens their continued usage every day. Um, a fraud management company, Avina, that works with some mobile money providers shared some data with me not too long ago. 73% of users who experience an incident of fraud reduce their usage. And 21% of them stop using it entirely. And it's not just that person. There's a halo effect that happens. So if I have an event, a fraud, an incident where I feel threatened, I'm telling my mother, I'm telling my sister, my brother, my friends, and they start to feel that threat as well. Fraud management is a shared responsibility. It's not for one party to address it entirely. We heard some great remarks here about the role that regulators can play, the role that mobile money providers can play, um, and also empowering the consumer to play a role in protecting themselves. At the GSMA, we've developed a digital financial literacy toolkit to support stakeholders to think about what role they play and how they can actually support and help to drive uh, digital financial literacy. But I really, really want to hone down on empowering users with knowledge and skills being such an incredible part of empowering consumers to ward off fraud and scams, and this really should not be overlooked. Going back to earlier in our session this morning, if you joined us earlier today, we were talking about the socioeconomic impact of mobile money. We mentioned that $600 billion additional contribution to GDP has been created through the use of mobile money. Many of our panelists this morning talked about, but why not more? What can we do more of? We talked about this African innovation that has you know, done so much but also that there's so much more we can do, which led really nicely into our second panel, which talked about innovation in African fintech. What's happening? 
what's trending, what's on the horizon. Our panelists talked about the importance of fast innovation, partnerships being really key, and open platforms and interoperability. To achieve greater impact to individuals, businesses, and economies, I took away three things from today's three sessions. Driving retail payments and the digitization of merchants is critical. Including women is imperative as they offer a huge opportunity for growth. And safeguarding trust through consumer empowerment and secure systems to ensure continued usage is non-negotiable. I don't know if you joined our first session this morning, but you may have heard me say there's work to be done. We have a lot of work ahead of us to ensure that financial inclusion also translates automatically into financial health. So I invite you all to join us as we work and continue to work in this ecosystem together, building partnerships and driving this agenda. I wanna thank our funders today, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and Visa for supporting our program and the work that we do here. And I wanna thank you for joining the Mobile Money Leadership Forum. Before we wrap MWC Kigali 2023, I'm going to invite up our Head of Mobile for Develop Ma Development, Max, to say a few words. So, no, Ashley and I did not color coordinate. Um, though I like the color. Um, thank you very much, um, everyone. This is a wrap-up of a wrap-up of a wrap-up. We wrapped up the session, we wrapped up the Mobile Money Leadership Forum, and now we're wrapping up three amazing days of content in this theater in the next room. 18 different sessions spanning financial inclusion, digital inclusion, gender, humanitarian, agriculture, um, AI, climate, and I should not do this without notes because I'm going to miss some and some people in the team are going to be upset. Um, I know I'm the last thing that's standing between you and changing to more comfortable shoes. Like def definitely, I'll, I'll enjoy doing that. But I just wanted to get a chance to share a few thoughts, but also, first of all, thank everybody um, for having been with us in the past three days, not only for listening to the people who are on stage, but for contributing, for making connections, and more generally for being, being with us on this journey overall. I have notes, because I'm that mixed of like, energized and super knackered, and I don't want to be talking for 20 minutes. Um, what have we covered? We've covered a, a broad range of topics, but really what we've shown is how mobile is really becoming more and more ubiquitous and is really like a powerful tool to like, bring more um, socioeconomic development, but also address, cli address climate change. And we've profiled so many great um, change makers whether they're from government or from mobile operators, from startups, from like all over the board, all across Africa. And for me, that's really the exciting thing, is just seeing how much talent and how much energy is going towards solving these big issues. And finally, as I said, we've made so many connections. I was very happy. For me, it felt almost like a, like a class reunion, bumping into so many people from different lives and so on, but just all united around trying to make the most of technology for Africa and for Africans. I started, for those of you who were in the room three days ago when I opened, before I wrapped up and wrapped up and wrapped up, um, I shared a few, a few stats and I maybe want to leave you with those same statistics. Only 290 million Africans today are using the mobile internet. Only one in four, about just above 200 million mobile money accounts are used on a monthly basis. And we still have like parts of the population, in particular women, persons with disabilities, persons living in, in rural areas, persons with lower level of literacy who are not ripping all the benefits that mobile and digital can bring to their lives and to their economies at large. That's the grim side because behind that there's so much potential. There are like 85% of the population in Africa is covered by a mobile internet network. And even if there are only 200 million active mobile money accounts, there are 800 million in Africa. That base is there. And like you've heard from so many innovators and partners, like how many different uses there can be of technology to contribute to solving um, the issues faced by societies, by economies, and, and by the planet at large. So as I said, that means for me that 
two things, really. One, we have a collective responsibility to work together and make sure that we are doing our best to address these challenges, but also it means that there's so much potential. There's so much that's happened already, but there's so much more that can happen. So that is just the last bit when I thank everybody. Um, I want to thank everybody who attended. I want to thank everybody who participated, everybody who was on this stage or the next stage or at the booth or at the boot camp in the past few days. Um, I want to thank the GSM and our members for their commitment to what we do at Mobile for Development. This is not something on the side. This is core to what the GSMA and the industry are doing. The usage gap is top of mind. So is climate. Unfortunately, so is, is humanitarian today. All these things are core to our industry. I also want to um, thank our donor partner. So starting with the, uh, this is where being tired is dangerous. Starting with the UK Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, um, the Swedish International Development Cooperation Agency, um, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the German Cooperation, and Visa. I think I got it right. Um, thank you very much. And the, the final thank you goes to the very familiar faces in the room, the members of the, the M4D team who have been running around like crazy, not sleeping enough, not eating enough, and I really look forward to having dinner with you tonight to, uh, to celebrate a great event. Thanks again, everyone. We'll see you in exactly in 11 months minus two days on the 17th of September 2024 here in Kigali for Mobile World Congress Kigali 2024. Thanks, everyone.